So today's story of Samuel is uh, what is known, at least in some of the land, um, as a classic call story. It's found throughout the Hebrew scriptures, and the key, two of the key characteristics are that it's unexpected and it's directly from God. So often it's hard to know that it's really God. Um, sometimes the person hearing the call usually doesn't think of him or herself as particularly God-worthy. So like, God talking to me? Like, I, I didn't expect that. Um, in fact, that person is usually someone who's maybe a little bit more marginalized or feels less than from other people. I'm guessing that maybe really, really, really important people aren't surprised that God is talking to them, but these people in the Bible tend to be sort of um, surprised by it because they're not that powerful. Um, and of course, they've never heard God speaking to them before, so they're not exactly sure quite what's going on, as you heard about Samuel and Eli. But this particular call story has a couple of unique features that are worth considering for uh, just a moment. So in most call stories, and Maureen mentioned one of the most famous ones, Moses, um, the person who God calls is initially reluctant to answer the call. So you may recall that Moses and God had quite a little conversation back and forth um, about why Moses doesn't think he's the right man for the job. They'll ignore me. I don't really speak so well in public. They'll never believe that you sent me. And God patiently, until the end, he gets a little abrupt at the end, but mostly God patiently addresses Moses' concerns and objections until finally Moses agrees. But in the case of Samuel, as soon as he understands that it's actually God calling him, he says yes. And he says it pretty enthusiastically and without hesitation. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now part of the difference might have been that Samuel was very young and didn't really realize like, what he was getting himself into. He had that exuberance of, sure, I'm in. But I think the bigger reason was that Samuel was affirmed in his call by Eli, someone that he trusted, and he knew he had a strong relationship with God. So he was kind of lifted up and supported in his call by his community. Eli reassured Samuel that the message was meant for him and that it was indeed from God. And he also told Samuel that he should follow God's call. So even though it would likely be unpleasant or risky sometimes, and even though it might make him kind of unpopular with others, God would be with him. In ministry, as I mentioned, we talk a lot about call and call stories. Um, you're actually asked to share your call story when you apply to seminary. Um, people talk about it in class. Uh, people ask you in church and ministry committee. Um, sometimes people just ask you in regular conversation. And so sharing your key call, your call story is a, is a part of that path to ordination. Now sometimes, and I know it's not just me, but I know for me for sure, as you hear the call stories of your peers, you start to develop call story envy. Uh, others have calls that seem really specific, right? I was called to do this and this and this, and you're like, that's pretty awesome and pretty definite. Um, or they might have had a call in a more spectacular fashion. Um, not literally a burning bush, but that, you know, they had this epiphany moment that just changed the course of their life forever. Um, and then some of them seem called to a much grander purpose. And so you look at your call story and you start to think, you know, did I really hear God's voice or was it one of those other 500 voices in my head? Am I really supposed to do this, or is it just something I want to do? Or maybe I think I've been called, but what I'm doing doesn't seem particularly heroic. Is it really a call from God? No, as I said, I know this was certainly the case for me, and I can honestly say, especially in the beginning, my journey in seminary started with more of an itch than a call. So when I was asked to tell my call stories, I was just always rambling, probably nonsense. Um, because I really couldn't figure out my actual call. Uh, it was good enough, though, to get me going, and it was a sense of restlessness that was really what brought me there, so I fashioned that into some sort of call story. Um, I felt very blessed 
by having a wonderful husband and family and job. I was generous in volunteering and outspoken on social and justice issues, engaged in my community. But I just felt like there was something out of place. So it was more of a, an unsettled feeling than an actual call in the middle of the night. But then when I was writing my ordination paper, literally eight years after I started the journey and answering the question about call, I realized when I'd actually gotten my call. And it had actually come uh, when I was a child. And it was such a part of who I am that I grew up with it. And I hadn't even actually noticed it as a big event. When I was preparing for today's sermon at 7 a.m., uh, I realized <laughs> I was looking up and I, I was thinking about call and how do you talk about it. And I found this quote from Deborah Cross, um, academic dean and professor of New Testament at an Eden Theological Seminary. And she describes God's call as an invitation to a lifelong relationship with God that in the midst of life's challenges and adversity is charged with the assurance of God's presence and is connected to a deep awareness of God's sovereign purposes of justice and peace for all creation. So said differently, I'd always thought of a call, especially when they ask it to you in this process, as a call to a specific job or occupation or your call to go do this. We talk about it as a vocation. But she talks about it as to accept this lifelong understanding of ourselves as precious children of God with a call to live out God's beautiful purposes for our lives and for all of creation. And that describes my call and the way I described it in the, in the process when I finally realized it. Because it really describes the way I was raised. As a child, I always felt loved and blessed, but different. My parents uh, raised my brother and I to believe in the possible goodness of others, that the world might indeed be fair despite what we saw, that good deeds are valued, and that justice is deserved by all, no matter what you look like, who you're related to, or the size of your net worth. And that might not seem remarkable for those of us living in Oak Park or who are raising kids here, but if you put that into the context, I grew up in the 60s. Um, I was a black, lower middle class young lady or girl in a 99% white middle class suburb. So I certainly experienced and continue to experience racism, but I also grew up supported by many warm-hearted people, white people, who fought for fair housing and equal access to education at my parents' side. So I knew deep inside that I was a precious child of God, because how else could I explain this bizarre existence? The fact that I grew up and was given all of these opportunities and blessings had nothing really to do with me. It must be because I was first loved by God. So I continue to strain to hear the call of God on my life, uh, to do my best to live out my purpose in a way that contributes to make the world just a little better, just a little brighter. I've stopped thinking of it as a big event and waiting for an aha moment. And I'm guessing that all of you might have a similar story of God calling you to something. Maybe some of you thought about it um, and can tell your story readily. Perhaps some of you have never really thought about it, but with some reflection, you could be able to see a faint pattern in the trajectory of your life. It might be something worth thinking about if you have a quiet moment this week. And if you think on it in a while and nothing comes to mind, don't stress. Relax and remember that you are a precious child of God. Lean into that relationship, be comforted, and as Maureen said, actively listen for God in the unexpected places. So today's scripture was about a call for one person, Samuel, but the impact that it had was really on a whole community, the nation of Israel. Because like most calls in the Old Testament that they wrote about, it wasn't just a, an isolated incident. It came at a time of spiritual emptiness. The people felt that there was no word from God, that they had been abandoned, there were no ethics, there was a lot of corruption, there was a military threat. 
And as the story of Samuel unfolds, you'll realize that the people were moving towards wanting a king. They wanted to change how they were governed. They weren't happy with being governed by judges. They wanted a single, all-powerful leader. God did not think that was a very good idea. He warned them they might not be happy, but they persisted. So it's a time when Samuel gets this call when it's not just for him, but it's an unexpected call that will prove to be transformative, not just on the impact of one person, but on an entire nation. Which raises the question about whether it's possible for a community to hear a call. And I actually think that it is. We here in the Pilgrim community are about to enter a challenging, but also potentially transformative time. Next week, we'll begin to say formally, just to say our goodbyes to Pastor Sally as she prepares to retire. So we'll look back, we'll share stories and memories, we'll tell her how much we appreciate her and Jim and their leadership and the witness that they've brought to Pilgrim, but also the wider community. And then in a few short weeks, we'll begin our search for an interim senior pastor and eventually our new full-time senior pastor. So while this time will undoubtedly be stressful, it also provides us with the opportunity to collectively revisit and discern the call to us as pilgrim. What is God calling us to do to be as a community? Charged with the assurance of God's presence and in the midst of the world's many challenges and adversity, what is Pilgrim's purpose, our role, in delivering justice and peace for all creation? Perhaps it begins with active listening. Amen.